What's up? What's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show because you are the CEO of your own life. I've got a great story for you today. Today's guest left his high paying but not super satisfying career in insurance to run a bird blog full time. Yes, Scott Keller started birdwatchinghq.com as a side hustle back in 2016. And he's since turned it into a full time income with up to a million monthly page views. But like all businesses, it's been an evolution to get to that point. Stick around to learn what's driving traffic and revenue today, the creative way Scott's grown his email list to over 50,000 subscribers, and how you can borrow some of the same tactics in your own business. If you don't have a website of your own yet, fear not. Blogstartercourse.com is my free video series on how to get your website up and running quickly and affordably. And if you need some niche inspiration, check the show notes for this episode to download your free bonus on 20 hobby niche ideas that you can start an online business around today. That's at sidehustlenation.com slash birds or through the link in the episode description of your podcast app. Ready? Let's do it. I try to think of an expensive product you could sell online that Amazon has. So it's going, if you make at the time, it was, I think, 8%. Yeah, if you hit their top tier. Right. If, you know, so it's like, all right, obviously, the higher I can refer people to, the more they would make. So, anyways, I came across uh, binoculars. You know, people tend to spend a lot of money on binoculars. Okay. As a high, per, you know, a high dollar, high dollar item. Right. There are some hundred dollar binoculars, but there are some binoculars that cost a couple grand for binoculars. So it's like, all right, let me go start some, you know, binocular reviews. So I bought, and I was like, who buys binoculars? There's really two types of people for the most part. Usually, either hunters buy binoculars or bird watchers buy binoculars. And between the two, I come from a long family of hunters. I've hunted in the past. I don't hunt anymore but I was much more into watching birds as well. So that fit a little bit more naturally. So I kind of started a blog, Birdwatching HQ. And my emphasis was going to be on writing binocular reviews. And my whole strategy for growing the blog, so I, I probably wrote, I remember it was like about seven different types of binoculars, wrote a 300 word review on it. Pretty bad article, you know, pretty junky. And, and I, my thought was I'd just go start commenting on other blogs, hoping that people go to the bottom and see it and kind of come to your blog. So I did that. I tried it for a while. Did that work? No. <laughs> no. And I'm sure everyone's been there when you, whatever you end up doing, the first ones you do are terrible. You know, whether it's writing blogs, making YouTube videos, selling, whatever it is, it just, they're not very good. So I think the big thing is just, I tried, you're trying to write and yep. you're trying to do research on things and, and, uh, writing about binoculars, honestly, for me, got pretty, again, pretty boring pretty quickly as well. After about seven binocular articles, it's not all that exciting. So that's when I started diving into, let's actually write some more about birds and birding. So for your listeners that aren't really into probably watching birds and birding, there's kind of two classes of people that like and watch birds. So the first term I'm going to use is called birding. And birding is where someone, if someone says they go birding, that usually means they are going to go actively look for birds. They might be looking at rare birds. You know, they found a maybe a, a certain type of woodpecker migrated that shouldn't be there or there's migrating warblers and they go actively looking for them. Okay. That's what I first started then writing about was birding and just really was ever I thought would be popular. Is you were, you were not an active birder yourself. I was a little bit. So I, yeah, so this was not just something out of the blue and I did not pick birds too, just cause I I've had friends come in my car and I've had bird noises playing. So I just enjoy learning about that. I was a biology major and I just, you know, I'd be like, Scott, what are you listening to? And like, oh, it's a black cap chickadee. Yeah, totally normal. <laughs> That's what <laughs> okay. I could listen to and hear it. So I was, I would go birding. I had binoculars, not all that much. And at this point we had a, our daughter was probably one or two years old. So it was hard to really go out and do much too exotic. And you can go for little hikes at the park, but I couldn't be chasing birds all around Ohio or, you know, flying to Costa Rica to look for birds at a whim's notice or anything like that either. So Anyways, wrote some articles about birding, just tips and gear and things of that nature. Again, not getting too, too much traffic, but I did notice the binoculars. So I will say one pivotal moment as far as writing came when I got introduced to um, Brian Dean's blog, Backlinko, and about basically how to write a blog article. So originally, it was just kind of how what I thought I should be writing about. And as what I started learning was there's a whole skill to actually writing a post, an article. 
And it's really made so much more about putting yourself in the shoes of whoever's reading that article. What are they looking for? Can they skim through your content, uh, making it much easier to read? And that's when I went back and redid a lot of those original binocular reviews. They started ranking finally. So at the time, I didn't really think about having things rank on Google until the first article. I remember the first binocular that ranked on Google. And I started getting like five visits a day to it from Google. And I didn't even think about that as a thing that would... That really wasn't part of my strategy because I just didn't know all that much from it yet. That's where it is. That's where you're going to get people to come to your your site. How do you write things? For, it's not about what I want to write about, which is what I've been doing. It was more about trying to get answer a question that someone's looking for on Google and actually write it in a good way. So a good re- think of it a good example of just I know most of my binocular reviews were titled you know like Nikon Monarch Seven review. That'd be the title versus changing it to you know, seven awesome reasons you should buy the Nikon Nikon Monarch 7 and just write it totally different that way. Oh, okay. So that stands out more in the search results because everybody else is just titling it Nikon Monarch 7 review. And so yours stands out in the search results. Yeah, it's just all about making your title intriguing. And then who wants to read just like a, a thousand word text with no excitement in it? Instead of this way, you have seven reasons you should buy it. It's really a review but you're doing it in a much different way. And some of those original, I mean, most of the, my binocular reviews, I haven't written a binocular review probably since 2016. I just actually checked before the podcast. They still, the one, the three I checked all still rank on the first page of Google six years later, which shows the power of writing a good article the first time around and making it sure it's, it's, it's done the right way the first time, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Was there any competitive analysis where you, search like, oh, there's already, you know, a dozen other sites that are kind of covering these same topics. I don't want to touch it. What was, you know, was that part of this process? Not a ton. I did. You, of course, you look at your competition for those things. I just never saw one I didn't think I could do better at the time. You know, like, okay, there's nothing that, there wasn't a ton of birding blogs that weren't just about, not many that were trying to help people with birding. It was more about kind of that deer diary. Like I went out today and saw this, that, and the other. But at the same time, with birdings, then I had a with competitive analysis. So I, as things started ranking, as I started rewriting articles, I started getting Google traffic. I was finally introduced to and started looking at like the keyword trackers. You know, how much traffic do certain keywords get with Google? So that's when I started looking at some of the articles I had been writing, which were just me picking it out of thin air. I'm like, oh, well, 10 people a month in the world search for this topic. So even if I rank for number one, that's not going to be very good. So that's when I started. I remember sitting in the hospital after my son was born uh, in 2017. This was like mid-2017. And they're born in the hospital and they're sleeping a lot. So I remember looking at like, all right, what's this keyword tracker? And I came across, I don't know how it was, something about hummingbirds. Where I'm used to most of the articles I was writing about was, you know, 10 visitors a month and you know, how to attract hummingbirds had, I can't remember exactly, but it was something crazy, 10 or 20,000 visits a month. I was like, whoa, people love hummingbirds. And I do, I mean, I I have a hummingbird feeder and I just never thought about writing about that. Then I started diving in and go. This was an article that you already had, it was getting traffic or this was a keyword that you found? This is a key, I was just doing keyword research. Yeah, I had not written this article before. I was just looking at future articles to write. Nice, nice. Which tool was this? (sighs) I forget what it was. I might have been in Google Search Console. I think that at the time, most, I use Uber Suggest now for most of my keyword research. But I think at the time, you could just go in Google Search Console and you could search around for, you probably still can. It's just a little more more in there. But Well, they had like the AdWords keyword planner at that time. And, and they, maybe they still do. But yeah, Uber Suggest is a cool tool. Yeah. But um, I've used keywords everywhere as like a like Chrome plugin for Google search. And they usually give pretty consistent, you know, they're not exactly all together, but it gives you a pretty good range, you know, of what's at least a popular keyword. Yeah. That's what I found. So that was when I, my aha moment of, oh, this is what I need to be talking about for a few reasons. One, this is where most people are actually wanting to like talk about and learn about is feeding birds in your backyard. Because along with how to attract hummingbirds, I started, there's Northern Cardinals, which are super popular, Blue Jays, there's types of bird seed. I started going down like, wow, there is tons of people are asking these sorts of questions, how to keep certain birds away from their feeder. What are the best types of bird feeders? What types of bird seeds should I use? How to, you know, what are the plants I should use to attract hummingbirds 
So that's when I, I started filling up pages upon pages of future article ideas where I was starting to kind of struggle already with what to talk about with birding. Yeah. It also fit my lifestyle way more because when our son was born in 2017, 2017, he was our second. Our daughter was born in 2014. So we weren't, again, setting up our bird feeders in my backyard was way easier than packing the kids up and driving two hours away to find a rare bird in Columbus, Ohio. Right, right. <laughs> And it just was more fun. I could really get into So that's what started what Birdwatching HQ is today, which is pretty much it's a website and a YouTube channel designed to teach people how to attract and feed birds and really other wildlife. We have stuff about butterflies and bats and owls, plants, insects, all that sort of stuff as well. But it's the, you know, 80% of the content is focused on birds. Okay. Yeah. So this, you know, about a year into the site, this light bulb moment of, oh, I can create, you know, really detailed, authoritative question and answer content based on what people are actually searching for. And I mean, I've had kind of a similar, similar epiphany and I hate to admit, it took me a lot longer than a year to kind of figure that out. But so good on you for figuring that out. And so SEO is the main driver today coming up with, you know, what people are looking for and then creating content around that. Correct. Yep. We're four and a half years later since probably that aha moment, it's the strategy hasn't changed all that much. I've tried a million other things, but the main thing that works for me is writing, uh, as far as birdwatchinghq.com goes, is writing content designed for a question that someone's asking on Google and trying to rank for that. And there's some other traffic sources which we can delve into, but even today, probably 80% of my traffic just comes from Google, Google search and yeah, answering, yeah, finding those those keywords. So, you know, at that point, I didn't have a bird feeder in my backyard yet. So when I started writing about bird feeders, it was, and I think maybe that's why some of my first content was hopefully helped rank when I was starting, when I was still learning about the hobby was I was writing my articles, you know, how to attract finches as I was trying to attract finches in my backyard. So doing research, kind of testing what worked. I mean, there was lots of articles I re, you know, went back and redid like, oh, that didn't, that wasn't, that wasn't true. You know, that didn't work out the way I thought it was. And I have a one employee who is all, who's a writer. We use I use a bunch of freelance writers as well, just to help create as much written content as possible. Especially just to help with that initial research, and then I always try to be the finisher, right? Kind of put in my own words and write it. In 2019, I was trying to think of ways that helps make my article stand apart from others. And when you come, really kind of yeah, like you remember where you visited. At that point now, I did have tons of bird feeders in our backyard, an awesome feeding station, different feeders, tons of birds. I live in a cool property, really in a suburban neighborhood, but it's um, backs up to like a swamp and some woods. So if you saw the front of our house, you'd never imagine in our backyard has all this wildlife, but actually extends about a, about an acre and a half in this neighborhood. And we just get tons of birds and hawks. And I mean, the other day I walked out and there was a snapping turtle walking like into the swamp in the backyard. So a lot of cool stuff. So I, I decided to um, look into setting up a live camera. Like, how can we get, like, how can people see what is going on in our backyard? And I thought when I first saw it, I thought, cool, a couple of things. One, if you came, it actually show I, I feed birds. And I, I think there's, we probably know, there's a lot of websites out there that write reviews or about things that aren't actually doing the hobby. So I wanted to show if I'm talking about how to attract a cardinal, you can actually see right now on my bird feeder, the strategies I'm using and telling you about are working. And here's the feeder I recommended. Look, there's a cardinal right on the feeder. Yeah. So I thought it would be, you know, you can, and you can embed that when I set it all up, we ran ethernet cords underground through conduit up to these about two um, high definition network security cameras. Okay. Stream in 4k. I mean, I went, there's a lot of cheaper ways to stream your birds, but I did not pick those ways. I tried to get the <laughs> the best. I was like, I didn't want to have to mess with it again. I, I just wanted to have, the best quality I could find if I was going to kind of do this. So from there we start, I just, you have to stream somewhere. So I streamed the live cameras. I created a YouTube channel for watching HQ and started, I, I did a camera up top on my bird feeders and then one that watches the ground underneath. Cause a lot of times there's a lot of birds that just like feeding on the ground squirrels come and chipmunks and there's some animals that come at night. So there's two cameras. Yeah, this stuff is amazingly popular. First, I love the note to be like, well, what can I do to set myself apart? You know, here's something that the average person who stumbled upon these 
keywords and during some affiliate marketing research said, oh, this might be an interesting, I could get some you know, low competition traffic if I do this thing. But it's like, no, you're going to have to compete with Scott, who's got these 4K cameras set up in his backyard. Like, no, we're going to play this game. We're going to do it right. And these things are amazingly popular. I'm on your YouTube channel now, Birdwatching HQ, 67,000 subscribers, hundreds of people as we're recording are watching some of these cams live. And there's, we got four or five of them going right now. It's, uh, it's a pretty serious thing. Yeah, that's that. one of the biggest surprises I had was that how popular the live cameras would be, not for the people, you know, it worked really well out for the articles. I could embed the live cam stream into an article. So as you're reading an article about you know how to track cardinals, you could press play and be watching it in the middle of the article and then keep reading. Yeah. That, I think that worked out really well. Which is great if it if it's there right now. If it's like right. <laughs> off in a tree somewhere, you're like, well, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I know. That's I've had that before. Like I have an article about how to keep squirrels off your bird feeders, which is popular. And sometimes they're on there. I'm like, oh shoot, I'm known why. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the opposite effect. But that's hopefully it shows in a way too. I'm not you're doing your best. You know, and when I you always like to see people make mistakes and we're all learning together with it. But it is funny. That makes me laugh sometimes too. But yeah, on YouTube, people started watching it and you know there's a on youtube there's a live chat feature on live streams where people can chat to each other and i wasn't on youtube all the time i'd sometimes go on there people would be talking to each other about the birds they're looking at on youtube and i didn't do this to like have a youtube channel it was just i needed to stream to youtube to get it into the blog yeah it's the easiest way and suddenly there's yeah at blocks there'd be five people watching at a time it always tells you how many people are watching and there'd be 20 people and 30, 40, 50 people and just kept growing. Like, oh my gosh, this is, this is crazy. Like, and people would be like, I'm watching from Thailand. I'm watching from Australia, you know, all over the country. Wow. I have this streaming in. So from there, just that piece of it took off on YouTube as well, which has been really cool. And we get, I love, I mean, tons of teachers use it in their classrooms. Um, I know my son's preschool has used it in their classroom. When they teach a lesson about birds, they can pull up and they, instead of trying to look outside, seeing a bird across the parking lot, you can see, I said, my cameras are really close. You can see like the details of the feathers when they're eating and, and what they're doing. So you can really see what they're up to. So a lot of people at work, I know a lot of people put it on at work when they're listening. You just have some natural noises in the background when they're at work. Nursing homes have told me they use the cameras. So along with the live chat, you start getting a lot of junk, you know, that that happens as well, unfortunately. So spam and things of that nature. So I've had to have have about, I think, seven or eight moderators is what they call them on YouTube. That and it's really they're all volunteer, which is really cool. And they are from again all over the world and country. We have even someone from Norway. Okay. And they they help moderate the chats. They answer questions. You can go on right now and to YouTube and ask a question about a bird you're seeing, or and typically one of the moderators is there to help answer a question. I'm on there a little bit, but it's really, it wasn't for the moderators. I wouldn't have a live chat. I just can't be there enough to moderate what's going on or the spam you get or links, but they, I mean, they clean it up instantly if something were to happen. Um, so they help, which is really cool. It's kind of community has been built on YouTube of people that, you know, some people come in and watch during the day. There's on the ground cam, you might see something, a raccoon come by at night to try to clean up some of the bird food that fell on the ground. So it's, and, and the cameras have awesome night vision too. We've had flying squirrels at night. So there's, there's always something to watch on the cameras. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. And it looks like there's a whole bunch of other video content on the channel as well that is getting thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of views related to some bird calls, I guess, recordings of those. And so people trying to identify that stuff, that's racking up some views. Anything else that you're finding working well on the video front? I need so that, that's one of my things to kind of delve back into. Um, yeah, I did some ID videos, like how to identify a morning dove or how to identify a great horned owl by sound. And I did a bunch late last fall and just let them sit out there. My goal with those was to get more found on SEO, you know, someone, you know, to see a video, video result. And they're actually doing very well. Yeah. Better than I thought they were going to do as far as, you know, they don't get a lot of views up front, but it's more of the evergreen Morning doves make the same noises today that they made 10 years ago. So if you make one good video on it, my hope was that it would keep ranking. So that's one thing this later this year, I want to go back and start making more videos for YouTube again. Because other than, and then you'll see some highlight videos where something cool happens. Usually if there's something new, fun, or interesting shows up, I'll we'll put a clip of it on there. But what's nice, 
a lot of the moderators, a couple of them have their own YouTube channels where they cut and make clips of the exciting that, I mean, every day they're making like, all right, this, these two birds, you know, did a, did their song on screen or a new bird showed up or something, anything interesting happened. They'll just make a quick one minute clip and post on their channel. And, uh, and which I'm totally fine with, cause then it gets, that kind of takes, I don't really want my channel to be the thousands of one minute clips. You know, I want to try to keep it the live cams and then hopefully some of the more helpful videos as well. So then there's a place for those people that want to see the, the exciting highlights or clips every day. They have a place to go for that too. Is there an ad revenue component through YouTube for the live feeds? Yeah, they make money. So the, it's not, the RPM is not good. <laughs> it's about uh, $2 per thousand views on the live cams. So, which from what I've heard, like anyone else comes on, I'm like, gosh, if I got that, I'm making a lot of money on YouTube. <laughs> you know, so it's, they do decent. Like I, I would share this with the, the two, the live cams probably make about a thousand bucks a month like between all the ad revenue for those, but they get tons. I mean, over time, millions of views about hundred, you know, every month it's a hundred, couple hundred thousand views on the live. They get a ton of views, but it just, there's not a lot of revenue there. One, you can't, they, they don't do in-stream ads on your live video. It's just when they first look at it, there's an ad. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if they leave it open for a day and a half, it's only that one ad at the beginning. It's just the one ad. <laughs> yeah, it is. Like the average watch time, I think it's like 15 minutes per person. So a lot of people do leave it on when they go to work. People do leave it on for their cats. Like I mean, people say they <laughs> do this. They put the live bird cams on just to entertain their cats while they're at work. Just torture the poor cats. Oh my gosh. Um, just for the sake of reference, in the side hustle, entrepreneurship, personal finance space, YouTube RPMs, several times that $2, like I'm looking at 36 over the last 28 days. So very niche dependent, but that's cool that they are monetized in some way. And then you've got the rest of the video content up there on the written side of the site. I see that, you know, these posts are updated fairly frequently. I don't know how much of this is like completely new content versus this is updating stuff from the archives, but I'm looking at titles like 10 ways to attract warblers exclamation mark, you know, parentheses number nine works best, which I think is a uh, a cool kind of like title tag SEO play. Like, oh, you know, now I got to go look and see what number nine is. I've got, you know, 32 birds that are yellow in the United States. Yellow is in all caps because I imagine somebody is typing in like, what is this yellow bird in my backyard? As if Google has any idea what you're looking at, but they can find Birdwatching HQ and like, okay, that's, that's the one I'm looking at. In parentheses, it says ID guide. So trying to like you said at the beginning with Backlinko and Brian Dean, like getting in the shoes of your target readers, answering their questions and like, you know, making sure that your listing stands out with, you know, these, these titles are, are, they appear to be well-written and attention getting titles with the capitalization, with the exclamations, with the parentheses, with the numbers. So I'll compliment you on that. Is there a strict publishing schedule that you stick to? And I'm curious about the republishing strategy as well. I'm doing two articles a week is what I'm doing. And same with my other writer. We're trying to do two articles a week. And most of the articles are, uh, not all, but I'm trying to this year create, a lot of the articles are based around, I call them email articles, which are articles that I'm going to include in an email to my list. Okay. And my hope is that I'm trying to, my goal this year is to do um, basically two emails a week throughout the full year. So about 100 or 104 emails. And then from there, almost ha- it'd almost be like a course over a year that I would use. I want to use the same emails next year because like this next coming email we have is going to be all about the types of flowers you can plant in your backyard to attract hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees. That list is pretty much the same next year as well. So it's going to hopefully be the kind of have 104 emails and then just throughout the every year rotate the same emails and I'll, I'll update it like this i'm updating ones from last year i did and that's a good way to have a good way to go through a lot of your content to update the content as well so i'm trying to fill that out and a lot of emails have multiple articles in it so not just 104 articles yeah set that up on a yearly loop i feel like matt from uh, some university matt Givinisi does something similar where you know it's very seasonal and so in the spring you know here are your pool care tips and then you know the next spring you know, either there are new people on the list or they forgot that they got this a year ago. And even if they did, it's still relevant to them today. So we'll go ahead and send it out again. 
And you're using uh, ConvertKit for this email as your email service provider? Right. Yeah. And that's, that's where I think I got where I got the idea for doing this. Yeah, using the same, I didn't really take email seriously until I heard this strategy. I was doing emails here and there, but now that I know I can use the same, basically the same template every year for my emails. And like you said, most of either be new people, they're going to forget what they got. And even if they don't, it's, it's all good stuff. Like how many times you need to hear something till it actually sinks in. So I think there was a course convert kit offered for free for someone they had. It might've been, you just mentioned as well, but I forget who, what the name of the person was, but they talked about this strategy and it was like a light bulb moment as far as, cause I, I was doing this. Cause I get a lot of clicks when I send an email. It's just the process of what email to send, how to send it, who to send it to. So now that it's, it's kind of a more of a strategy for it now. So every Monday and Thursday morning is like email day. So it's kind of the main content deadline I stick to is a Monday, Thursday email. And so those are, you're sending those out as live, like I just published this. This is kind of like a live newsletter thing versus an automated series. Yeah, but it's, it's not so much new stuff. It's the, I schedule it in advance, but it's whatever that, like this Thursday is going to be all about the flowers for those like hummingbirds. That'll be the same email next year, probably around this Thursday at that point as well. So, but I'm trying to do new content to fill out the emails. I have some emails that I know already articles will already fit into that, but I don't have enough to do an email every Monday and Thursday that's, I think, relevant. Because there's certain, like, when you're just looking at the new articles, we did an article all about types of yellow birds that live in the United States. That's a keyword that people search for. That's not we're going to fit into. It. We're never going to send that out as an email to people. It's really not a helpful email unless you specifically saw a yellow bird and that day and you want to know what it was. So most of the emails are very common things that are problems or like teaching emails. Like Monday was all about a certain type of bird seed, the birds it's going to attract, why you should use it, how to use it effectively. So most of those emails are kind of complete guides for something you should know. And mm -hmm. How are people getting on your list in the first place? What I use now is a, it's a quiz. It's a pop-up quiz that happens and it works so well to get email addresses. I struggled for years. That was part of the reason I probably didn't take email that seriously for a while because I couldn't figure out how to get anyone on my email list. I, I tried free PDFs, you sign up and I'll send you this or the pop-up. I remember using Sumo, I think AppSumo, one of those Sumo something to pop up and get it. And I always got maybe, it was under a 1% convert. And it was, I remember I always hovered around half a percent convert rate. So like, that is just, that's not a lot of people when you get on your list. So I finally ran across something called uh, tryinteract.com and they do quizzes. So it's basically now when you go to my website after it might be 30 seconds, I forget exactly how I have it set up a pop-up is going to come up and instead of your normal pop-up, like please sign up for our list. It just has a picture, has a picture of a cardinal and it just says, what bird is this? And it's like, it gives like A, B, C, and D. So it goes straight into the quiz. Okay. And yeah. And hopefully that's an easy one for people to get. They recognize it from football uniforms, baseball uniforms. Okay. Yeah. So it asks 10, it goes straight into a 10 question quiz, basically testing your bird knowledge. And then after you complete the quiz, you get your, so it has a page where you can sign up for the email list. But if you don't want to, you can skip that step. It has a spot that says skip this step if you don't want to sign up for it. By then, someone hopefully has bought in enough to, to do it. But then to see their answers, they either have to hit skip this step or you know sign up for the email list. To see results. And then it redirects over to the results page? Yep. Then it redirects the results page and they get a score and a, you know, you had to fill in like if you get, I had to make up little names like your bird brain or, you know, stuff. <laughs> you kind of make it creative like, all right, you did great or you need some help things of that nature. Then it takes them to an answer page if they want to see yeah, the results page, the answer page. And that has increased my conversion rate to get emails to between two and 3%. So just overnight, I had a four to five hundred percent increase in the number of email addresses I've got, which just changed how my email list has grown. I've been using this quiz now for probably over two years I haven't even changed. I've never even changed the quiz. It works so well. And it, it's just, it's a good, it's a good quiz. Like it's, uh, it's fun. And I, I have a 15 question one too, that you can send people to. And it's people like quiz and test on how they do it. We use it on, I, I'll share it on the YouTube link and our YouTube channel as well. So that, but that has grown our email list a ton. And now it's, now it's a significant part of my strategy. 
That's really cool. I love this idea of just jumping right into the question, not, you know, the pop up that says, do you want to test your bird knowledge? You know, click here to proceed. Like, oh, what bird is this? You know, shuck, I know this. I'm going to answer this, you know, and then they go through and they're building this positive momentum and, you know, making the email sign up optional. You know, we'll show you your results either way. But if you want to opt in, like, OK, we'll do that, too. And then um, people are doing that. I mean, to go from with just with the volume of traffic that you're getting to have two or three percent of the people sign up, because this is always the challenge with Q&A content. It's very transactional. Like I have a question. What yellow bird is this in my yard? OK, I'm going to find the answer. Scroll, scroll, scroll. OK, I think it's that one. And then they're done, right? There's no necessarily a reason for them to keep coming back to your site, to bookmark this, to sign up for the free PDF guide to whatever it is. It's like, okay, so you you kind of have to capture them in that moment. And it sounds like this quiz is working really well uh, to do that. So appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, no, it is. What you said originally with that jumping right into the question, it was nice that the tool, you can test things and it gives a pretty good analytics on it. And that tested kind of what you just said, way better than having that first pop up, like, hey, take this 10 question quiz to test your bird knowledge versus just going straight into it. I forget exactly the difference, but it was significantly better just to jump right into the question and not worry about a cover page on it. And yes, it definitely has helped now build a community of people I can email every week and I think appreciate the weekly tips and tricks they get. Um, That's what I've tried to, like you said, this question and answer Google SEO is pretty, I mean, I know you're pretty transactional, right? You said you want to, you get what you need, then you leave. So between the live cameras and this email list, I think it's helped build a community of people that originally find me for something else, you know, for that piece of thing they were looking for. Is there a concerted onboarding sequence after somebody does opt in? A little bit. Yeah. They get three welcome emails, just a kind of introduction. Like, what is it? What's my mission? You know, some of the most popular articles, uh, that's how I introduce them to the live cameras to the email sequence. So that's, I think it's a three or four welcome sequence that they get once you sign up. Okay. Then they get emails Monday and Thursday. Okay. Yeah. We talked a little bit about the YouTube ad revenue, but curious what else is ringing the cash register for you? Because you mentioned we started out with this affiliate thesis. Oh, I'm going to sell binoculars. And it sounds like maybe that's evolved over time and with the volume of page views. I think the graphic that ConvertKit shared was half a million monthly page views or something, a ton of traffic. So is it ad driven? What's uh, what's the monetization strategy? It is. So right now, yeah, and they're actually, I'm excited. We should hit one of the second time ever in April, we should have had a million visitors to the blog. So that's, I'm pretty excited. This is the bird time of year too. Like April and May is like, things are migrating. It's warming up. So like the next couple months are always our best my best time as far cool. as it's like peak season. Yes, it is. This is like an exciting Sundays, every Sunday, like peaks on Sunday, then slowly gets back up. So the next couple of Sundays are like the biggest, it will be the biggest of the year typically. But, um, but yeah, the main source of income, uh, which has changed since I first started, but it's ad revenue. I'm with ad thrive, the ad network ad thrive. That's I'm doing some rough S in my head, probably 75% of my revenue is from Ad Thrive ads every month. Second best source of revenue is Amazon affiliates. And that used to be by far number one until they changed you know, a year or so ago. Their ad, the way they do ads as well, or affiliate, excuse me, the, the percentage. So that is, it's definitely by far, you know, that might be like 10%, 10 to 15% is probably Amazon affiliates. I have a couple other smaller affiliates. There's not a ton of some other, for sort of bird products online, Feeders, this is binoculars, bird feeders, bird seed, and and maybe even people trying to set up their 4K live feed streams. Like, here's the camera that I used. There's surprisingly a lot of good products as far as affiliate programs that sell those products. There's not any really. So, some of the other major players I've reached out, they just, I don't know if I'm like ahead of their time. I don't know. So it's just like, hey, I, I have like, I can send you traffic. I just, can we help each other out? So, I don't have to send it all to Amazon, but I haven't got much of, I don't know, not much works. I just, most of it goes to Amazon because it's, it's Amazon and it's where it goes. But I've, yeah, some of the binoculars like BH photo and their affiliate program, because they yeah. sell a lot of that, you know, binoculars and things too. For the ad thrive stuff, is there a target RPM that you're happy with? Yeah, it's, and that changes throughout the year as well, but I'm happy with it. Usually averages maybe 35 bucks every thousand views typically. 
35 to 40. And it's, it's interesting. It depends on the post, how long it is, what, you know, what products there are, where it's from, things of that nature. But overall, I kind of look at it. I track every month, like the total, if I get a thousand views between Amazon, if, between Amazon and ad thrive, how much do I make per thousand views is kind of the spreadsheet I always look at and see all that trends over time. So right now the average is about 40 bucks per thousand. Visitors. That's great. Yeah. This is the constant debate in my own head is I've got, so, you know, a lot of the content is affiliate driven, but a lot of it is on, on side hustle nation is just straight informational or not a great affiliate play. And so there's just, you know, the traffic comes in 99% of the people don't sign up for the email list and then they bounce off. And it's like, well here, you know, with ad thrive. And so I've debated trying to embed it on, you know, only specific pages. I don't know. It's just, but that's, that's a helpful kind of benchmark metric. You know, you're making three or four cents per page view. And just, if you get enough traffic, it really starts to add up. Yeah. That's what, um, you had a guest on recently. He was talking about from, uh, like he was up to like 20 cents per page view or something like that. I was like, man, all right, I got some improvement. I don't know how to get up that high, but that's, I was, thought I was doing well, but the, it's from the college investor. I forget. His yeah. Name. That was Robert. Right. And he's, you know, in the, of course, in the financial space, you have banks, you know, spending tons of money to acquire customers. So, but I was also kind of, you know, my jaw dropped a little bit when he said, I was like, mm. it's like, right. gosh, I'd be, man. But anyways, yeah, that's, you do what you can with the niche you have. Okay. So we've got ads, we've got affiliates. And then what's the, the final piece of the pie there? The third one is the YouTube revenue, YouTube ad revenue. Also, which um, that's okay. But then also the, this is where it kind of goes down to over time. You always, it's like kind of like the shiny object syndrome. You always want to try new things versus just what's working. But I started, it's been a year or two now, but I also have a small e-commerce store where I sell some of the products that I do recommend just directly uh, drop ship it. I drop ship them a couple feeders and it, it was hard. I was I had bigger plans originally for it, but it was hard to find warehouses that would want to work that would want to drop ship and the products I was already recommending, you know? So, but there still is definitely, I found one that I really like working with, especially there's a certain type of bird feeding pole, which is squirrel proof, which sells for about 200 bucks. And I make about $50 every time it sells. Okay, I see this. The Squirrel Stopper Deluxe Pole and Baffle Set. I'm on that the, is it. Uh, BWHQStore.com, which was redirected from uh, Birdwatching HQ. And you got a bunch of merch on here, too. Um, really, you know, pretty well-designed T-shirts and swag and coffee cups and stuff, like, for your for your hardcore fans. Yeah, so that, but it does all looks really nice. The problem I'm... So I was kind of being this year, I, was, I got on a kick of, all right, I want to try to diversify the revenue source a little bit and try to find some more, you know, so we kind of doubled more another in just in case, you know, I'm one Google out Google updates his algorithm. And that's the main source for traffic that, you know, I was trying to figure out other ways to diversify a little bit. So e-commerce store has been a challenge. It does decent, but it doesn't do great. You know, I think a lot of our products you can find on Amazon, unfortunately. So I know I've done this at sites. You go and go, Oh, that looks awesome. Glad you recommended it. Can I get it on Amazon? Because I already have my account saved, you know, and I yeah. think that happens quite a bit. I'm actually running some tests right now. Of like, is it like, how much do I make if I send it to Amazon versus how much I make? Like, what's a click worth if I send it to my store versus Amazon? And is the difference, it's better on my store, but is the difference worth the time and effort it takes to have that? Yeah. And the reduction in conversion rate. And yeah, that would be an interesting test to run. On the merch side, this is dropship stuff too, or you got to a garage full of t-shirts uh drop ship too yeah i didn't want yeah it's uh print on demand through i've shot it's a shopify store so there's uh, i think it's called spod is the print on demand product so it's super easy we had to get i hired some designers on upwork which is a place you can find freelancers to make a lot of those shirts i just try to come up with the idea i'm definitely not a designer so we i outsourced that and i agree they look really nice the problem is i'm probably not gonna at this point what's on there is going to be what's on there. I don't think we're going to, I'm going to keep pursuing the merch too much more. You know, I was thinking, all right, if I could have some like really funny, witty bird shirts and things, I and mean, people love that sort of thing. But again, it goes back to my focus. What I'm good at is writing content that answers a question. And the more we start, I started doing that when I keep saying we, it's because I, I do have another employee that helps me a lot with this stuff. But the more we kept doing this other merch stuff, 
the less we were writing content. And then like last week, I think we didn't sell that many t-shirts. It was a few. So it wasn't like that. Of, I mean, maybe sold five t-shirts. I'm being honest. In the last so week the time two. is better spent creating the next article that's going to get 5,000 views a month and then 5,000 views the next month. And it becomes a more evergreen tactic. Right. It's that getting distracted by all these other awesome, there's a million ways to make this. If I have a side hustle nation podcast, there's a million ways to do it, to make money online. And you could spend all day finding the new one. And that's, I think between the e-commerce store and the, the merch and some other ideas I've tried in the past too, you're like, all right, what's the things that actually is working and I want to spend my time doing. And I'm sure if I spent all my time making designs and getting, trying to get on Amazon merch and selling them, it might work out. But then I heard your, you talked about it a couple of weeks ago on a podcast that you just, you got suspended from Amazon merch for without any reason. And I'm like, man, that, that would stink if you spent a lot of time doing that. And then. Right. We're on the blacklist now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With the mark of shame. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So I, it's nice. It's up there. I, I mean, I, I like the shirts. I, I bought some for myself just cause I like them, but I don't think, uh, I think it's moving forward as things are going, it's just make content. That's what I like doing. I think what I'm good at doing and if anything, try to double down more on YouTube stuff. I think I'm starting to see, I think what's working there as well, as far as in addition to the live cams, what kind of videos can I make? Cause videos I create that are just your normal video, get a much higher RPM than that $2 per thousand. This, those live cams get a pretty low RPM, but some of the other ones get like those ID, like how to identify certain bird videos get quite a bit higher. Okay. Was it Upwork where you connected with your, the writer that's on your team as well? No, she was, um, she worked for me at my insurance office for five years. So she was, she's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So when she's perfect for it, honestly, this is a better fit of her talents than she was good at the, she was my, my office managers at the insurance office. So when I decided to leave, so yeah, last June I left my insurance office, which had been a year in the making. I was, I did everything the right way. I told who I needed to tell and what I was doing and, you know, got the looks of, Hey, you're giving up your insurance office to go blog about birds. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Lindsay came with me when I left and she's been doing great and she's enjoys the writing process a lot. What made you feel comfortable taking that leap last year? It was a few things. One, I made sure we were ready for it financially. I probably could have done it a year or two prior to that, but I wanted to make sure if I was going to do this, I didn't, if the Birdwashing HQ stopped producing any income that we were, you know, I didn't have to go find the ne- another insurance job the next week, you know, that it was right. once I left insurance, I was like, I'm probably not. I, I, that was a great portion of my life. I learned so much about running a business and how to manage people. And I mean, I will always be very proud of my career with uh, my insurance agency and that company I worked for. Uh, but it was time, you know, it's, it was time for something new. And so I think one was just monetarily. It was also emotionally. I, I had um, four employees, team members at the time. So when I, when I left, that was their, their jobs as well. And I was close. Every single one that worked for me for multiple years, most were over five years. So that was, that was a tough conversation of what I was doing, but, and just, I guess, moving forward and actually doing it. It's always, when you first start your side hustle, you're like, all right, this would be awesome if someday my side hustle could take over my real income. And then when it gets there, like, oh shoot, this is, I remember when I first started, it was like, if I could just make a thousand bucks a month, like right. I'm set, like I'm good. That is awesome. Then it was like 5,000 a month. All right, if I make 5,000 a month, like I'll figure out the rest. I just don't want to, I'll just, I'll just quit. And then you get there like, oh yeah, I'm not, we're not doing that yet. <laughs> <laughs> the, the goalpost keeps moving. Right. It does. And then you finally just you get to a point, I don't know, just you slowly kind of come to like, what if then you start talking? I don't know. Then it just finally clicked and you kind of put a date on it. And then I moved the date up a few times and it just, it felt good. Like once you made, I think it was once you made the decision, and I felt good about it financially, then everything else fell into place. Like telling who I needed to tell on the insurance, you know, for my agency side, you know, everyone was, I kind of kept it a secret. Not many people knew that I was doing this. Like my close friends and family did, but like no one at work knew. I, it wasn't like my employees knew I was in the back. After I sold some life insurance, I was like, going to go start writing about hummingbirds, you know, <laughs> so I was yeah. like, that was a, I would do that a lot, and I, but no one really knew about it. So well, now you've got your name and face all over the site. Was it a little bit more anonymous in its early days? Yeah, very anonymous. It was 
it just was Scott and there was no pictures of me. And yeah, cause I'm pretty, pretty introverted by nature. So even now when I, sometimes I look, I'm like, Ugh, I really want my face on there, but I think it helps to know it as a person. That's kind of why I decided to step out and go, okay, I should, I know when I follow someone, I like to know the person and see their face and know they're just, you know, who it actually is. So totally kind of versus like, well, who knows? It's just, it's just some, you know, content farm conglomerate. Exactly. You know, like, yeah. You know, so I think that helps to personalize it a little bit. It makes me, at least makes me feel better about, you know, giving somebody my email and following along. Like there's a more personal connection there for sure. Exactly. So, and all that stuff, you build it up in your head more than it actually matters. You don't really, it was, once you start telling people like, this is awesome. I wish I could leave. <laughs> I don't want to do insurance either. Can I come, right. what can I make a website about? <laughs> like, oh, I don't know why I was, should have told everyone a lot sooner, but it's gone well. I think too, you, I think I've heard this with other people that kind of leave a career to produce, produce something else or do financial, you know, reach financial independence and want to leave their job is that they probably could have done it earlier because just by nature of getting to reaching financial independence, you're probably going to have a side hustle on the side. You're not just going to sit around and watch Netflix at your house. You're going to be doing something to create some income. So you have had no money stress since I left the insurance office. It's been yeah, even health insurance, all that stuff fell into place. And it's been, I'm happy that I, I did it. I have no regrets. For what yeah, I'm that's, that's good. I'm happy to hear it. I'm excited for you. And I mean, at this point, you've weathered a bunch of different algorithm updates and the site obviously has some staying power. So I feel like it's somewhat future proof in that way, or at least you would, would feel comfortable enough in saying that I expect this trend to continue. And if not, I got all the time in the world to go and fix it. So is yeah. there such thing as a day in the life, week in the life today on the you know, hours that you're investing into it? Yeah. Most days, um, I don't know if ever, have you ever read or heard of the book called deep work by Cal Newport? Yes. Um, basically the, the gist is like having three or four hours a day of uninterrupted time. Where you can just focus and create something is 10 times more effective than eight to 10 hours of looking busy at an office. So I, I read that and it took it really to heart. So I try to really do it every, and I'm much better in the mornings and the afternoons. So as soon as we get kids off to school or wherever they need to go in the morning, I, I lock my door or go to a coffee shop and just try to focus and write. Usually it's writing, you know, writing content and just have like, my goal every day is four to five hours of that kind of deep work, no distraction. I typically have my phone in the other room and just plow through that. Then once I'm done with that, once your brain is, my brain is done after doing that for a while, like I cannot stare at a computer screen anymore. Is I, that primarily spent on content creation? Yeah. Content creation. So when I have that, I guess I got the deep work time. It's all about content creation. Okay. It is, um, yeah, even emails. I'm not great at answering emails. I try to do that at night after the kids go to bed real quick or, or things of that nature. So when I, I try to keep those like morning four to five hours, very precious. Like it is, that is when you can, it's amazing how productive you can be with, you know, putting some headphones on and just start knocking out some content. So after that, usually afternoons, I'm either going on a hike, playing with the kids, working out, doing yard, you know, yard work or reading, trying to brainstorm something new. So, you know, that's was my prior life as the insurance agent. It was, it was eight straight hours sitting in front, chained to your desk, you know? So I, I did not want to replicate. You could do that with that too. I could sit here for eight hours a day and I, I try, sometimes it's tempting to sit there and like, all right, I'm behind. I want to get some more stuff out or got to get to this, this, but I try every day to make sure, get my outside time in. I got to take care of the feeders too. So I got to go out there and you know, that's, that definitely keeps it. It's a commitment when you start feeding birds, especially on camera. Cause if you miss a day, it, you get like text messages from the moderators. Like, yeah, your, your worldwide audience is going to be upset. Right. Like you got to make sure they're clean. The water, you got to make sure if you're on camera all like 24 seven on these live cams that it looks nice out there and the birds are fed or you hear about it. So that is a, uh, but yeah, that's kind of it. Content creation. I'm trying to keep it simple. Again, we have little kids, so we're trying to, you know, spend as much time with them as possible and things of that nature. Absolutely. Yeah. A friend of mine said they called it like the golden years between, you know, having the kids out of diapers and before they get their driver's license and really trying to, you know, squeeze as many memories as you can into that time. And it's awesome that you got the flexibility to do that, to have a business that serves you and serves others and serves the family as well. So really cool. I was going to ask any, anything that you would do looking back now to accelerate your journey, knowing what you know today. I would definitely just double down on 
you know, for the first probably two years, I only worked on the, on the website in the morning. I'd wake up at 5 a.m. before the kids woke up. And, you know, sometimes, you know, with little kids, sometimes they wake up at 5.45. So I'd get down, get ready at 5.30. Then like 15 minutes later, they get up. I'm like, oh, hmm. well, there goes yeah. my... Uh, so I only, I would probably would just have fit in any time I could. Because once it started picking up, I was still waking up early. I was, you know, at lunch break, you know, I'd, I'd go to the Panera Bread at on lunch to write. I'd leave work a little early to go write. When the kids went to bed, I'd write, you know, you'd, you'd pick up that content schedule. So I was only doing a little bit in the mornings for probably a year or two. So I probably would have picked up, like just double down on produce as much good content as possible and just worked even harder at it. Very good. It sounds like that's kind of the future plan as well. It is creating additional content, answering people's questions and getting discovered in search. You mentioned some more YouTube focused efforts. Anything else on the horizon? Uh, you know, right now, that's definitely there's like ideas that you have to kind of analyze if it's a good idea or not. I, I love the things are going well with traffic right now. So it's probably double down on that. Definitely YouTube. Uh, kind of my dream with it is I, I'd love to buy a huge piece of property and like turn it into like a bird, you know, almost like be a Airbnb place where you can come to the bird watching HQ, like the bird watching HQ HQ, you know? <laughs> like the, oh, okay. Yeah, awesome. So like where you can come watch, like have trails and nature trails. And um, we have some pretty, in Ohio, we live real, they call it the warbler capital of the world as the migrating warblers go through by Lake Erie. I live pretty close to that. So I always thought we need to, so that's kind of a, Hey, down the road, if things keep going well, we need to have a physical place where I'd love to meet. I mean, I get a lot of very kind emails from people all over the world to actually have a, a way to meet them, you know, have a spot where you can come and, yeah, kind of demonstrate some of these firsthand and stuff like that. So I don't know. That's, that's kind of a future, like, big goal down the road for something like that. But for now, it's more content and more content. I love it. Keep scaling up that traffic. Birdwatchinghq.com is where you can find everything about Scott. Really appreciate you joining me. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. I would say focus and patience. If you focus on something for long enough and you keep learning about it and you keep working and working and working at it, it's going to pay off. So focus and patience together, I think, is a pretty hard combination to beat. It's so true. Scott, thanks so, so much for joining me and we'll catch up with you soon. Yeah, thanks a ton. All right. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Scott as much as I did. A couple notes I wanted to highlight. The first was when I asked Scott about his competitive analysis early on and what the existing landscape of bird blogs looked like. And his response was, I never saw one. I didn't think I could do better. I love that confidence to say I can create something better than what's already out there. I also love Scott's call to double down on what's working. In this case, creating more evergreen articles that earn traffic and revenue month after month, year after year. Money doesn't grow on trees, but you can plant these little money seeds on the internet. So I like that idea. Scott's quiz funnel for email collection is awesome. And I may have to borrow something similar because it sounds like it's working really well. In fact, we had Ryan Levesque on the show last week, giving us a deep dive on all things quiz funnel related, using those to grow your audience and serve the right content and the right products to the right people at the right time. Definitely encourage you to check that one out if you missed it episode 508 in your podcast app. If you liked this episode, check out my chat with Tammy Smith next. It's on how she took her fitness blog to as much as 20 grand in monthly revenue in her first 12 months. A lot of times these tools will show you that there's zero search for something and you can write the review and sometimes it'll go right to page one if you're lucky because no one else has done it and you'll actually get immediate sales on it because there is search. It just Google hasn't picked that up yet. I have to be very strategic with my time because <laughs> it is definitely limited with two kids at home. I usually only honestly spend probably two to three hours a day working on my website. I would definitely do more if I had the time. It just doesn't always shake out like that. I divide my time between determining what articles I want to write. I write all my own content and I do it very quickly, which is something, you know, probably I really mastered with doing the freelance writing. Considering I have knowledge and passion in the things that I write about, it's pretty easy for me to just fly off an article during nap time when my kids are napping. You can scroll down to episode 432 in your podcast app to find that one. If you don't have a website of your own yet, blogstartercourse.com is my free video course on how to get your own site up and running quickly and affordably. 
And if you need some niche inspiration outside of bird blogs and fitness, check out the show notes for this episode to download your free bonus on 20 hobby niches that you can start an online business around today. That's at sidehustlenation.com slash birds, B-I-R-D-S, sidehustlenation.com slash birds, or through the link in the episode description of your podcast app. Big thanks to Scott for sharing his insight this week. That is it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of The Side Hustle Show, where we're talking about how to use some of your side hustle income to fund your retirement and save on taxes at the same time. I'll see you then. Hustle on.